The Philosophy of Science and Theology. Science and religion are in eternal warfare with co science constantly advancing and religious, religion constantly backtracking and occasionally taking a stand only to surrender that ground and retrench. Best thing for religion to do is simply to never take stands and that way it will never have to give them up. Now many of you have heard that kind of uh, claim. Now, we're going to be discussing philosophy of science and theology, and the Bible doesn't really say too much about science. Certainly nothing directly about modern science. It's, the word science actually does appear twice in the King James Version, believe it or not. First Timothy 6.20 O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so-called. Is that fair? If you look at most of the translations now, it's called knowledge, and that's understandable because the Greek has and the antithesis of pseudonymous <coughs> knowledge. Gnoseos is actually cognate to the, to the Hebrew, English word knowledge. However, in the Vulgate, it does actually use the term science, uh, sciencia. Um, and the King James follows the Latin. So you can kind of make it the science of the day, I suppose. The other place that the, the, the word is translated in the King James is um, in Daniel 1 verses 3 and 4, specifically verse 4, the king spake to Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seeds and of the princes, which is apparently standard procedure for him, children in whom was no blemish but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning and knowledge and understanding science such as had the ability in them to stand in the king's palace in whom they might teach the learning and tongue of the Chaldeans. That word is Mada. And um, it actually occurs three times in Solomon's prayer where Solomon asked for wisdom and uh, God gave him that. And uh, it occurs in Ecclesiastes 10.20, curse not the king, no, not in thy mada, thy thought. In that particular uh, passage is translated and probably fairly so. And then interestingly enough, Daniel 1.17, a little further, um, where Daniel was given wisdom and science, and um, again, both of those are translated Scientia or Scientiam in 117. So it does have to do with the, um, with what you could call the science of the day, but the question is, what about our day? And that raises another question, what is the correct philosophy of science? Interestingly enough, when you get a PhD in science, it's actually a doctor of philosophy. Um, I'm going to ask a few other questions. Is science all-inclusive? Can it have any interface with theology? Now, if you answer questions three and two as science is inherently atheistic and science is all-inclusive, then there really isn't any room for at least a positive theology. I guess you could say a negative theology. There is no God or certainly God doesn't have any contact with the world if there is one. Um, and so, I, Adventists really have a hard time going that way, and I don't blame them. Adventists cannot ignore science. Uh, we, can teach, we teach people medical science all the time. 
We believe that some principles of health, uh, spelled it wrong, are, are, are sound, and they are actually scientific principles. However, we cannot claim, we cannot accept all that is claimed to be science. Richard Dawkins is, I don't think, a good role model for Adventists. And that means that somewhere we have to draw the line between, I guess you could say, good science and bad science, Somewhere we have to make a differentiation. Um, so we'll come back to the question, what is science and what differentiates science from non-science? That turns out to be a very difficult problem. It's called the demarcation problem. What is science and what is not? Uh, I'm going to start by approaching it in a kind of intuitive way. This is the kind of way that uh, you might get from uh, Thomas Kuhn. Um, physics and chemistry, I think, are fairly well defined as science, especially physics. Uh, math is a little more difficult because there's no experimentation involved. Biology and geology, maybe some aspects of them. Um, the whole of them is a little more difficult. Uh, psychology, social science, economics are a little more of a stretch. History probably doesn't belong, although there are people who would say, well, history is scientific as well. Um, Marxist theory, I think, is pretty well trashed as a science, even though it was pr originally proposed as a science. Um, and that raises another question that you have to decide, and uh, that is, if something is not good science, does that mean it is not science, or does that just mean it is bad science? And uh, I think that it's probably fair to say um, that at least some things are bad science, or at least not the best science. Um, and several definitions of science have been proposed. I'm just going to run through some of them quickly. The study of the reproducible. Um, the study of events for which there is a mechanism. The study of theories which can be proved. The study of falsifiable theories. The study of research programs. That one is uh, by Imre Lekatosh and the study of paradigms, which is one popularized by Th Thomas Kuhn. And then there are even people like Fairbend who says there is no method in science. Um, there, are, there is one that says it's the opinion of scientists. That's an interesting question. And finally, for each one of those, is science what is reproducible or is it what is known to be reproducible? And the same with other definitions, theories which can be proved, or falsifiable theories, or theories that are known to be falsifiable. As soon as you know it, does that make it science? Um, and as long as we're clear on which definition we're using, it's not too bad. And maybe what we should do is start saying science by definition A or by definition B, rather than trying to uh, uh, establish once and for all for everybody precisely what is meant by science. I find the last definition in particular not helpful. It becomes circular. Scientists are those who study science, right? Well, science is what scientists study. Um, how do you determine one or the other in, in, a, in a reasonably objective way? Um, does somebody who has a PhD in science automatically a scientist? If so, Ariel Roth is a scientist. Um, but there are some people who would say he's a pseudoscientist, but he's got a PhD, so I guess whatever, you know, whatever scientists study. <laughs> <laughs> But it does raise a point, and it's an important point, and that is science is often thought of in that way. 
That is, it's what all the scientists say. And I think the term, the current scientific consensus, captures that use of the term fairly well. Now, I had one person write that science, scientists, the job of scientists is to write papers and obtain grant money. <laughs> and if that's the definition of science, then I guess some things can turn out to be not scientific while still being true. Because there are people who tried to write grant money, uh, tried to write papers and obtain grant money and were stopped from doing so, but who turned out to be right later on. Um, the one thing I think can be said for sure is that the current scientific consensus cannot uncritically be equated with truth. The previously current scientific consensus has been wrong in the past, and just a few examples of many that could be adduced, Einstein and relativity. At one time, Einstein was thought to be a nut. Um, he's pretty well acknowledged as one of the all-time geniuses. Um, bacteria causing ulcers. At one time that was thought to be to totally stupid. Um, washing hands prevented disease. At one time that was thought to be stupid and the person who proposed it was hounded out of uh, his job and probably committed suicide because of, uh, because of a social um, disfavor, but he turned out to be correct, which means that the current scientific consensus being authoritative simply would be flying against the, uh, flying in the face of all the evidence we have, and furthermore, the current scientific consensus being authoritative would stop all scientific progress, because after all, progress means that you started in one area and moved to another and it was proper. And so if the current scientific consensus is the authority in science, then you have, uh, you have no hope of changing that consensus in any meaningful way. Now, the study of paradigms, Kuhn's uh, idea has something to recommend it. Science is often done that way. Uh, I think you have to be careful assuming that that's all there is to science. Kuhn sometimes sounds postmodern, and if there's one thing I think that scientists are not comfortable with, it's the idea of that the postmodern can be let run forever. In fact, I think postmodernists usually aren't that postmodern either. They still eat uh, food. Uh, one, the other part of Kuhn that I think is faulty is that one can understand two paradigms at the same time and actually work within each of them to make predictions that can disagree with each other and that can lead to crucial experiments which are important in science. Um, and finally, I think that uh, Kuhn is weak in that a more well-defined a theory is, the less it looks like a paradigm and more, the more it looks like a research program of uh, Lakatos. The <coughs> A study of provable theories was once a popular definition. You know, gravity was proved. All those other ones couldn't be proved. But the truth of the matter is most theories can't be proven and that included gravity. And in fact, in a small but important way, Newtonian mechanics was proven wrong. Um, and that gave rise to Einsteinian relativity. Now, the question is, was it science? I think it's fair to say it was science. Is it still science? Is it bad science? Again, it depends on how you define things. Um, but regardless of the definition, I think it's fair to say it was good, it could be improved, it was improved. Uh, is Einsteinian relativity now uh, the real science or is there another one to come. And that's one of the reasons why physicists are very cautious about telling people, no, you can't uh, mess with relativity, because they know it's already happened once and it worked. Um, can we say with any security that general relativity is science? No, probably not. 
In fact, the issue of provability caused the degeneration of theoretical science into logical positivism. Only sense perceptions and their descriptions are science. All further descriptions are not, because see, those are the only things that could be proved. One of the things that science has had to do, and doesn't like it, uh, was to give up on absolute certainty. Is the other problem with logical positivism is that it would mean the sun's existence is not science. All we can say, for sure, is that we see light coming from a particular part of the sky when our watch gives a certain time. And, uh, and again, whose watch and so forth. Um, and yet, science seems to be comfortable saying, yes, there is something called the sun out there. Um, well, if, if provability is not part of science, well, what about falsifiability? It was intuitively an important criterion, and I think that Karl Popper had something. How do we know, the problem with the Popper's theory is that how do we know that the information that falsifies the theory isn't itself false? We kind of accept that, if you like, by faith. Um, Remember, you can't absolutely prove anything, including that falsifying evidence is true itself. And the other problem with Karl Popper is that it suggests that science went around and proposed theories in order to trash them. Actually, most scientists don't go around trying to prove theories false. Rather, they try to find theories that can be tested, but are not falsified. I think, though, that Popper had an important aspect of science in view, and that is theories that are not falsifiable are in fact useless. Science is, in the end, to an attempt to say, find a theory that can be relied upon to say that, for example, given certain circumstances you will find a particular planet, let's say, at position A, rather than position B, C, D, or so forth. The more positions ruled out, the more useful the theory. You can predict exactly when an eclipse will happen, for example. But by the exact same token, the more positions ruled out, the more falsifiable the theory. Um, falsifiability and predictive value are two sides of the exact same coin. You can't have one without the other. And so if scientists want predictive value, they're going to have to live with falsifiability. I do like the idea of scientific research programs, a research program being a core with um, auxiliary hypotheses that can be changed, but preferably don't have to be changed too often, and that, um, uh, that explain data as they come in. But the idea of research programs would actually work for any discipline, including theology. It's one of the notes that uh, Nancy Murphy did, and uh, I think that she's right about it. Um, now, so if I'm going to try to define science, I don't want to use it with scientific research programs. I think that scientific research programs are a good way of finding truth, just that they're not confined to science. And my best definition of the field of science is the study of the reproducible. This gives science some advantages. Uh, fraud and mistakes can be uncovered because if it's not reproducible, um, you can figure out that, uh, that uh, it isn't really part of science because it can't be reproduced. And I think there's another point that is helpful to know, and that is that scientists have no independent authority. Everything they do boils down to two, po two points. One of them is they have observed nature once, and nature can be depended upon to uh, do the same thing again in, the same, in a similar circumstances. Um, and so, when you get done, you don't actually need the scientist. And they can make appeals to logic, which once the appeal has been made, you don't need the scientist again. They might point it out, it might be helpful, but, um, but the logic stands on its own, not 
on the basis of the scientists. The most authoritative scientists are precisely those who are most transparent. This view, by the way, is parallel to the Adventist view of theology. That which reveals the biblical points most clearly is most authoritative, and it doesn't matter who says it, um, and it doesn't matter how loudly one says it, either it fits the biblical view or not. The only difference is that the Adventist view of the Bible takes the Bible as normative. Um, I think I would make the case that if you treat the Bible as data, the two uh, views uh, are extremely closely parallel. Now, I will criticize two further views of science. One, science is the study of that which has a mechanism. It sounds wonderful. You can figure out how it works. That, therefore, it's science. If you can't figure out how it works, it's not science. Well, of course, historically, uh, many things were discovered before their mechanism was discovered, and so you're going to have things popping in and out of science that way. But more importantly, quantum mechanics has no known mechanism, and in fact, no prospect of a conceivable mechanism. Those who know quantum mechanics best tell you that if you think you understand uh, quantum mechanics, it's a good sign that you don't. Um, however, quantum mechanics is arguably our best example of science. And so the need for a mechanism is not a good definition of science because it fails at probably the best example of science. Um, and the th second one I'm going to criticize is that science requires methodological naturalism. Now. It's important to note, as a counterexample, that Newton's theories did not require methodological naturalism. Newton himself was an interventionalist and had no problem with it. Uh, one can say that once one gets out of naturalism, one is no longer in science. Um, but one cannot say, without begging the question, that there cannot be truth or knowledge, gnosis scientiae outside of methodological naturalism. One can only say that science, defined as methodological naturalism, cannot get one there. Perhaps science, defined as methodological naturalism, cannot reach outside its own borders, but it can, at least in theory, point outside its borders. This brings up the question of why we're even discussing what is science. And the truth of the matter is the reason why is because science has a lot of prestige. Science is often believed to be the best or, in some people's mind, the only way to find truth. If science loses that distinction, if we give up on that by insisting that me methodological naturalism has to be part of science regardless of what it does to science, then the definition of science loses a great deal of its importance. And certainly the the argument over whether something is scientific loses most, if not all, of its importance. And the question comes up, what if we find that some events are not, after considerable effort, explained by methodological naturalism, but are still reproducible? Might they not point to a god of order, just not a god who works solely by physical mechanism? If resurrection happens repeatedly, um, then it's, you can argue that science doesn't include it, but what I think you can't argue is that it doesn't exist because it doesn't follow along with methodological naturalism. The insistence that methodological naturalism must be explained everything and therefore should always be followed is in fact philosophical naturalism. And the whole reason for calling it methodological naturalism was to try to get away from the, uh, using philosophical naturalism as a starting point because everybody knows that if you start with philosophical naturalism, you can't get to God, but that doesn't prove God doesn't exist. The insistence that there must be a naturalistic origin for life is belief in naturalism 
in the teeth of the evidence we have. Uh, Eugene Koonin in 2005 published a paper arguing that the odds are so low, using, by the way, ridiculously liberal estimates for the possibilities, that the only viable alternative to a creator is practically infinite universes. To be specific, his estimate was uh, 10 to the minus 1018, which basically means more universes than there are particles in this one. Nor is this the only area where naturalism seems to be failing at present, and failing worse than would have been assumed in the past. My own primary area of research strongly suggests that there's carbon-14 in material that's supposed to be millions of years old, from which it should have all decayed away if uh, naturalism were true. There is soft tissue and dinosaur bones that shouldn't last for millions of years. Human Y chromosomes are markedly divergent from chimpanzee Y chromosomes, looking like at least 300 million years of evolution have passed using current assumptions. And everybody knows that um, chimps and humans haven't been separate for that long, if they ever were together. Mitochondrial barcodes look like species are unique and well over 90% originated less than 200,000 years ago. And if you correct that for historical mutation rates, that reduces the figure to around 6,500 years ago, plus or minus about 2,000 years, which is rather striking. Published estimates for protein folding probabilities suggest that the ratio of usable protein to useless amino acid sequences for 150 residue protein, which is a small protein, is of the order of 10 to the 74th power. That's just striking. We are finding brand new genes, sometimes called orphan genes, in virtually every species, including humans. Not found in chimpanzee, for example. Uh, some old problems have been solved. The claim that the Yellowstone fossil forest ha had to take 300,000 years to form has had to be abandoned. Um, signs up at the National Park Service had to be changed. The claim that the Coconino sandstone was formed by widespread desert dunes has been undercut by the features of the trackways it contains. And we could go on. Um, the origin of life problem is more important than it might appear at first glance. If one accepts the idea that life was designed, then the problem of who designed the designer becomes acute. Either the designer is eternal, or the designer was him, her, itself, whatever, designed, and at some point the designer had to have its intelligence not dependent on the organization of matter. Or the designer of the designer of the, the designer of the designer of the designer. Um, in which case that person or thing is essentially supernatural. The designer probably is the same one that designed the universe to begin with. In which case the designer must have had effectively infinite power and effectively infinite intelligence. It is hard to withhold the word God from that entity. But there are other conclusions that can be reached from that fact. Number one, the popular press, or even the textbooks, cannot be relied upon to give the truth about a theologically charged subject. We have to go back to the original literature, which is very comfortable from an Adventist point of view. Um, if we want to know more about earth history, theological inquiries, what God would do or says he did, are more important than asking what nature unassisted by intelligence can do, which is what many people feel is science. Finally, sometimes at least, science and logic, when done properly, can point us in the direction of theological truth. It is, therefore, appropriate to carefully approach a theological question from a scientific viewpoint as long as that science does not rule out miracle a priori. I think there is a pressing need to integrate careful science and theology and history into as coherent a whole as we can do with the available data. 
I think that a conservative approach to theology can be shown to be compatible with that synthesis. We shall see if it works, but that was the premise of the book that I wrote, Scientific Theology, which is available in a number of different places, including scientifictheology.us, probably the best place right now. Um, as I was going through this, I ran across an old uh, video that I made and uh, ran into a quote from Wikipedia uh, on uh, Imri Lakatos um, from 2010, which was fascinating. Um, Lakatos is the guy who recommended scientific research programs and I would have to say probably the best example of what how science should be done. Lakatos's own key examples of pseudoscience were Ptolemaic astronomy, Belikovsky's planetary cosmogony, Freudian psychoanalysis, psycho 20th century Soviet Marxism, interestingly enough Lakatos used to be a communist way back when, uh, Lysenko's biology, Bohr's quantum mechanics post-1924, astrology, psychiatry, sociology, and neoclassical economics. Obviously, he was not a fan of sociology or economics. And in his 1973 uh, London School of Economics Scientific Method Lecture 1, he also claimed that nobody to date has yet found a demarcation criteria according to which Darwin can be described as scientific. Thus implying Darwin's theory of evolution did not satisfy Lakatos's only criteria on, of at least predicting some novel facts. And so either it was pseudoscientific or else there was something wrong with Lakatos's criterion. Now, I think that the person who wrote this was raising questions about Lakatos's criterion. I could be wrong. Uh, almost 20 years after Lakatos's 1973 challenge on the scientificity of Darwin. In her 1991, The Ant and the Peacock, pages 31 to 32, um, London School of Economics lecturer and ex-colleague of Lakatos, Helena Cronin, attempted to establish Darwinian theory was empirically scientific in respect of at least being supported by evidence of likeness in the diversity of life forms in the world, allegedly explained by descent with modification. She notably first admitted that in respect to our usual idea of corroboration as requiring the successful prediction of novel facts, Darwinian theory was not strongly, um, was not strong on temporally novel predictions and certainly didn't identify any. In fact, she was thoroughly equivocal about whether it did or did not make any novel predictions, only saying, for the most part, this evidence was already well known, thoroughly documented by a pre-Darwinian natural history. So if only for the most part, then what other part of the evidence, if any, was not already well known but had been novelly predicted? Cronin did not say. But she then asserted it was scientific on the weaker Zahar criterion of predicting independent novel explanation of old, already well-known facts. So that would that was one of the criteria that had tried to expand uh, Lakatos's idea. In 1973, Elias Hahar had proposed Lakatos's criterion that the prediction of novel facts is a necessary condition of a theory being scientific, should be diluted to make independent novel explanations of old known facts that were not otherwise explained a sufficient condition of scientificity, a proposal that was partly endorsed, endorsed by Lakatos that year. The declared motivation of that revision was to explain the Einsteinian grand theory of rel relativity, a general theory of relativity, revolution in mechanics, which Zahar apparently <coughs> dated to 1915 by when it had made no novel predictions and hence was apparently an anomaly for Lakatos's criterion of scientific revolutions as requiring the successful prediction of novel facts. But it had explained the old fact of the anomalous perihelion of Mercury in 1915. However, Zahar's 1973 had notably failed to establish the GTR revolution happen 
happened in 1915 in any great majority conversion of the scientific community that year, rather than post-1919, say, when, by when it was thought to have successfully predicted the novel fact and degree of gravitational lensing, allegedly confirmed by Eddington's 1919 exper eclipse experiment. Moreover, in the second outing of the application of Zahar's new criterion to try to explain the heliocentric revolution in a joint paper with Lakatosh, it had again failed to do so. But this time, its attempted explanation of a scientific revolution was historically unsynchronized by a draconian two millennia or so too late, rather than only at least three years early, as in the GTR revolution case. For in the Lakatosh and Zahar account of it, Aristarchus' simple heliocentric model had satisfied that criterion in its novel explanation of planetary stations and retrogression, retrogressions and of the bounded elongations of Venus and Mercury, which were, of course, held by Copernicus to support his theory. However, she even more notably then also failed to demonstrate that it provided any confirmed nomological deductive explanation of any old facts of likeness within evolutionary diversity, whatever, only making a mere assertion that it did so without proof. In fact, not only with respect to predicting explaining likenesses and diversity, but in fact, nowhere in her book did Cronin provide any example or demonstration of Darwinian theory successfully predicting any novel facts, nor of it independently novelly explaining any known fact about anything whatsoever in terms of the standard positivist nomological deductivist model of scientific predictions and explanations advocated by her. So if Cronin's 1991 attempted a application of Zahar's criterion was its third outing, then it also failed that test inasmuch as there was indeed a Darwinian revolution as Cronin believes, but Darwinian theory had neither made any novel explanations nor provided any novel hypothetical deductive explanations of old facts, but rather merely provided metaphysical speculation about evolutionary possibilities in the kind of empirically unilluminating Kipling-esque just-so stories it has been accused of. That was Wikipedia. That's not a creationist site as far as I know. And uh, in fact, after I read that, I noted that you may want to copy that page in Wikipedia before it gets taken down. Sure enough, um, this is what it says now in that same area. Lakatosh's own key examples, or Ptolemaic astronomy. Uh, interesting uh, that now they have italicized Soviet Marxism. Um, uh, and the other list is the same, except that they added Darwinian theory, Darwin's theory to the end. And uh, then they have a section under Darwin's theory. and. Uh, now they have a quote uh, in his 1973 LSE scientific method lecture. One, he also claimed that nobody to date has found, yet found a demarcation criterion according to which Darwin can be ascribed as scientific. Um, and then, th he, then it talks about uh, Helena Cronin. Um, and basically says, she wrote that, our usual idea of corroboration as required the successful prediction of novel facts. Uh, Darwinian theory was not strong on temporarily novel predictions. However, familiar the evidence and whatever role it played in the construction of the theory, it still confirms the theory. Um, and that sounds a lot nicer to Darwinism than the previous quote, or previous but now you get to weigh in on this. Yes, uh, Ariel. Yeah. Interesting uh, discussion. Um, it seems to me that the focus could profit from a, a broader question which uh, you have alluded to, and that is, uh, you can define sign in so, so many different ways, you know, that's, that's obvious. Uh, some people feel it's one thing, some another. Uh, but we're looking for truth. 
which is a level below, above the definition, uh, that which is actually there, uh, and uh, regardless of how you define science and where you are, what limits you want to put on it, uh, the fo if the focus would be on truth, I think uh, we'd uh, have to deal with other questions like uh, what's the origin of consciousness, uh, free will. Uh, you can try and explain those away by, com by uh, you know, comprehensive programs and so on to a certain extent, but. Uh, uh, still, uh, leading scientists still raise the question about consciousness. Uh, how did that come about? But it, uh, it includes uh, the question that uh, many scientists try to avoid and that you clearly pointed out, you know, what about the origin of life and the complexities we see around there? Uh, and to say, well, uh, some scientists are very comfortable with, you know, well, I'm just going to stick to nature and uh, what that shows. Uh, but that is too limited an outlook. It's too simplistic for uh, the reality that we face, you know, our, our, conscious, our consciousness, uh, our concept of good and evil. Uh, these are things that uh, science does very poorly with. Uh, but that I think uh, need to be included in the equation and uh, need to be uh, or would be addressed right in a broader term of what is truth. And uh, science is a legitimate, naturalistic science is a legitimate uh, approach, but your conclusions should be sheltered within that limitation. If you're going to uh, claim it's all truth, uh, you're closing the door to a lot of facts. Coming back here. Leonard Brand. Well, I enjoyed your presentation, and I, and I agree with what I think you're saying, and that is from a philosophically uh, philosophical point of view, it's pretty tough or maybe impossible to give a precise definition of what science is. It's, it's just too loose in many ways. What I find more useful is, is a practical consideration, several practical considerations, especially if you, a distinction between things that, that are happening in front of us that we can study over and over and over again, like chemistry or physiology. Um, we don't always get it right. Um, molecular biologists concept that the central dogma of molecular biology is that one gene makes one protein okay we get those things wrong but but we can keep improving our understanding and there, there's no at least theoretical reason why we can't keep on improving and if we had enough time till we get it right and that's different from events of the past many events of the past we cannot know unless somebody tells us like the murder of Abraham Lincoln the time I ran out of gas on the entrance to the Golden Gate Bridge. I mean, you just simply can't know that unless I'm willing to tell you that. Uh, how life began, you can't know that unless somebody tells us. Uh, and in geology, there are many things where um, if you take science the way it's usually done, methodical naturalism, you have to reach certain conclusions, which may be totally wrong if, if the assumption is wrong. Um, was there, you can't know that there was a global flood unless somebody tells us. We, we, from studying what we can see, we can't detect that. I mean, a million years from now, we may have enough information to say that. But <clears throat> the study of the, of the past, things that happened in the past, if we take seriously what the Bible says, we can make discoveries that will, will never happen unless we do that. And, and there are many examples I could give to show that that works. Well, I may be wrong, but I think that the problem with defining science is that there are two poles, at least, that are trying, that people are trying to put under the same tent, and they don't actually fit with each other well. One of them is 
uh, one of them could be put as uh, philosophical naturalism, applied philosophical naturalism, if you please. And the other one is um, uh, the other one is uh, the method of uh, Lakatosh applied to reproducible events. And the two of them actually don't always fit with each other. And, and therein lies the problem. Well, is it science, is it, does science say that evolution is true? Well, it depends. If you have philosophical naturalism, yes, it does. If, you do, if you're talking about uh, what we were all taught as a method of science, working on the facts of science, no, not really. And, you know, I think that's uh, what left uh, that huge discussion at the end from Wikipedia was that, yes, there was a scientific revolution in, in the sense that many scientists, most scientists, went from being non-believers in Darwin to believers in Darwin. But um, the logical reason for that is not as clear as it should be. Um, <clears throat> problem with some of that, of course, some of those approaches to science is the assumption you have to start with. Methodological naturalism is an assumption. I'm uncomfortable starting research with a conclusion or with an assumption. Um, now somebody will say, well, yeah, but if you're going to believe in the Bible, you're starting with an assumption. No, I don't need to do that. If I'm going to study, for instance, a certain geological formation I'm studying, uh, I don't, I'm not going to assume anything. I can make, define a number of hypotheses, including some I don't like, and then I can look at the evidence and figure out what fits best. And often when we do that, it doesn't fit the, the naturalistic point of view. But nobody's going to know that if they start with a naturalistic assumption. And so we don't, I don't need to be afraid of data. We don't need to be afraid of looking at all a variety of possibilities and trying to see what fits. Because that, that yeah. works better. So what you're suggesting is that a generally Christian, specifically Adventist view of science, can in some way have its own integrity. Absolutely. That, that you don't have to start with the assumption that the Bible is true. You just simply have to not start with the assumption that the Bible is not true. Yes. Your biggest problem is convincing the scientists out there to listen to you. But that's another issue. <laughs> Uh, comment over here, Jack. Just a brief comment. It's, it's always fascinating to listen yet again to this sort of discussion, and that comment was not intended to be negative at all. Um, I remember so clearly uh, being a presenter with a group that represented our church who were totally uncomfortable with methodological naturalism. And so I asked them a simple question. Since this was a central meeting in a rather remote part of the country, I said, how many of you flew here? Do you believe in methodological naturalism? We, we fly because the outcome is predictable. And that is a core feature of methodological naturalism. You reject it if it doesn't reach a certain level of predictability. That doesn't prove methodological naturalism answers all the questions and is always reliable, but it's the best tool we have when we're doing day-to-day -day, uh, evaluation, experiments, uh, <laughs> measurements, derived from nature yeah if I am we, if we can li if we can live with mm -hmm. the limitations I am uh, comfortable with that methodological naturalism does explain a lot but I'm just not sure it explains everything of course um, yeah. I, w I would uh, say that methodological naturalism uh, is a restricted view uh, and needs to be uh, presented within that restriction uh, 
and uh, you need to not use it as equivalent to truth uh, because you can go way off the line on mythical on naturalism mm -hmm. uh, from a practical standpoint uh, not to sound too pejorative uh, there is little difference between atheism and methodological naturalism and that atheism does point out the bias of methodological naturalism. Comment back up here again. The, a comment on methodological naturalism. If I'm, if I'm in my laboratory doing chemistry research, okay, chemi methodological naturalism will work, but it's unnecessary, it's totally irrelevant. I don't need to use, I don't need to assume anything about naturalism I just need to assume that my, my chemicals will react the way they're supposed to. And so methodological naturalism, when you're do, studying things that happen in your laboratory and you can watch them, or were you flying an airplane, uh, the person who designed the airplane didn't need to know anything about naturalism. And so it's, it's, it's unnecessary in the cases where it works, and it's a problem in the case where it doesn't work. Yes. Uh, I agree with a good deal of what you presented up there today, both your ideas and the ideas that uh, you were quoting. I disagree profoundly with some of the others. Let me mention where I'm coming from. Basically, my career of 40 years has been as a teacher of philosophy, so I have been a student of philosophy of science, and I've taught it at major universities like the University of California at Riverside, Oxford University in England. Um, first, there's a presumption at the beginning of your presentation involved in the phrase that you showed up on the board, the consensus of science. Uh, there is, as far as I'm concerned, no consensus among scientists if you're talking about philosophy of science or theories. In fact, a major preoccupation of the last century and a half has been to find a final theory that would produce a consensus. But there's a very sharp division uh, between the uh, scientific explanations or theories that arise out of the original Newtonian synthesis and which was modified by Einstein to some extent with a relativity theory and the new worldview that's emerging out of quantum theory and quantum mechanics. And uh, that is a very basic division. Similarly, there's no consensus in the field of theology. Uh, you have uh, hundreds of denominations that have existed over the last 2,000 years or disagreements about what the Bible means, and how it's to be interpreted liberals versus moderates versus progressives or uh, certainly any time scientists venture out of the field of the observation and measurement of natural phenomena inside the universe and the attempt to construct theories or paradigms or models from mathematics or logic that enable them to develop what are called laws of nature that predict what's going to happen in the future and even gain control over it by developing technology that can modify it in some way and do what the first philosopher of science, Francis Bacon, called improving man's estate. Uh, there can be agreement but uh, basically when scientists make pronouncements about how the universe came into being or how life started or uh, whether or not miracles are possible, they're venturing out of science, ceasing to be sciences and becoming metaphysicians or attempted metaphysicians, attempted theologians, something like that. And the so-called new scientists, the ones who claim they have scientific proof that the universe evolved by chance out of nothing, 
such as Michio Kaku, Stephen Hawking, Richard Dawkins, uh, you can go on and on. Uh, they are not only ceasing to be scientists, they're becoming, for the most part, rather bad and amateurish philosophers. And the idea that science, the scientific community as a whole is in agreement with them, that there's a consensus and that science has turned away from God is obviously not true. You can mention scores of scientists who are either Catholic priests as the uh, originator of the Big Bang Theory, La Mettre was, or uh, paleontologists like Chardin who supports the theory of evolution but is nevertheless an ardent believer in God and felt that the universe was working toward what he called a Christ logos, end time prediction of the kingdom of God. You have more recent ones and uh, notably since the 19 or since the 2016 election you have Ben Carson, uh, who was for uh, three decades director of the Johns Hopkins Hospital uh, and has received the Presidential Medal of Freedom, who is an Adventist elder. So uh, the idea that science in the main has turned away from God is totally false. It's, it's, uh, further demographic studies show that the distribution of belief and agnosticism and atheism among scientists is about the same as it is for the general population. I, I think the one thing that I would say to that uh, is that there is pretty much a consensus on some things, even though there might not be a consensus on many. And I agree with you. In fact, you mentioned uh, uh, Kaku. Um, Kaku has actually made some cogent arguments for the belief that uh, there is an ultimate observer who collapses quantum mechanics that way. And therefore, one, uh, one could rationally suggests that he actually believes in a god in an important sense. Um, so even there, there's not the unanimity that you were talking about. Um, but there, there is a broad consensus in science, I think, that, the, um, that life on Earth extends somewhere between uh, 700 million and, and uh, three and a half, four billion years, um, and that uh, that humanoids go back five or six million years at least. Mm -hmm. And so I think that uh, it is fair sometimes to talk about a consensus even though once you start delving into that consensus, you'll find a lot of uh, disagreement within yes. that consensus. Of course, even in the field of theology where I said there also is no consensus. You have liberal Christians who deny the divinity of Jesus or the Trinity and who uh, accept an evolutionary uh, theory and who believe yeah. you have Buddhists who believe as the new atheists do that the universe came out of nothing and that everything will return to nothing which they call nirvana and yeah. yet Buddhism is uh, probably the second major world religion because they say in spite of that we owe compassion to one another and all sentient beings right. and they build a religion so on that as the Dalai Lama. You could say there is a Buddhist consensus even with, uh, in spite of the diversity of opinions in various areas. There was an attempt, of course, in the first and second centuries to get a consensus in theology by the uh, major creeds, the Apostles' Creed, and the Nicene Creed, and the Athanasian Creed, but they don't even agree. For instance, one of them 
leaves baptism out altogether and the others say it's necessary for salvation. So there's never been a consensus in theology. Yeah. Well, in science, we generally recognize that 50,000 scientists can be wrong. Yeah. And so we want to be very careful about even if we do establish that there's a consensus, it does not mean that the consensus is correct. Right. Mm -hmm. And over and over, the history of science has proved that what was taken to be absolutely true was only partially true or even false and has to be revised. And presumably the same thing has happened in theology because you can find a, a parallel development there of beliefs as to what is essential to salvation and what is not, or beliefs about what the Bible really means or does not mean. Yeah. Go ahead, and then there's a question <coughs> behind you. I'm pressing on my upward way New heights I'm gaining every day. I'm praying as I'm onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on higher, higher ground. Lord, lift me up and Lord, let me stand. By faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane. Than I, I have, have known. Found. Lord, plant my, my feet, feet on higher, higher, higher ground. Lord, lift me up and come on, church, and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land. A higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. For, this is a hard act to follow. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Thank you. The, uh, what I was going to add to it is um, I feel more comfortable with the uh, broader approach to truth that Adventism has and that the Bible has than I do with the more restricted approach that science has. You, you, you could go to the news, you go to repeat, review articles everywhere, constant uh, cosmology especially, you know, uh, constant seeking after explanations uh, without the potential that there might be a designer or a god there. That is not part of the parlance at present. Uh, science is a restrictive view in, of, in a search for truth. Bible encourages us to look at nature. Science doesn't encourage us to look at the Bible. I prefer the broader approach. You're more likely to find truth if you set up more possibilities on your horizon. Solo scriptura. <laughs> you know. Solo scriptura. Yeah. I'm going to point out one other thing, and that is that uh, regarding novel facts, um, I don't think anybody was anticipating what we found when we started looking at paleo currents. That is, in my opinion, a novel fact. Um, actually, the, the trackways in the Coconino sandstone, I think, are a novel flat fact. Mm -hmm. And I think that although the, it isn't strictly a novel fact, it is, in the Zahar sense, a, uh, a fact that uh, fits easily into one paradigm that doesn't fit into others, uh, pair conformities. And it is a novel fact, I think, that, uh, that one can find um, soft sediment deformation between uh, formations that, have, uh, that are supposed to be separated by millions of years. I think that that was something not expected 
uh, surprising, and if I recall correctly, mostly new, certainly new in terms of uh, people's knowledge of it. And so I think that it's fair to say that uh, although there hasn't been as much research as I'd like to see, I think that uh, one can fairly characterize uh, uh, short-age creationism as a, uh, as a progressive uh, research program at this time which means that there's something to offer to it. And uh, let's see, did you want to reply and then uh, go ahead? No, nothing to no. Yeah, okay, so. Um, <clears throat> well, I have to think about what does science really depend on? What is it, what is its core foundation? That is the idea that the laws of chemistry and physics will continue uh, as we expect and they are reliable. Okay, so, um, why is, why are they reliable? Well, it, I suggest that it's really possible that the chemistry, the laws of chemistry and physics that we know were invented by God and he maintains them in regular, he, may, he makes them continue uh, through time. If that's true, then naturalism at its very core is dead. Go ahead. I, I'm interested that the um, methodological naturalism debate often returns to whether or not airplanes can fly. There was a, um, uh, a TV series, I don't even remember what it was uh, called now, um, but the fellow who put them on I wrote a chapter on something that has fascinated me ever since I read it. It had to do with whether or not airplanes can fly. He said that as the pilot taxis down the runway and picks up speed, uh, there comes a point where his speed is sufficient for takeoff. And he um, gives the command or he himself pulls back uh, on whatever the thing is. That he <laughs> and the, the command is rotate, which means he turns the nose of the plane up. Given the speed at which he's traveling, he's pretty sure that the plane will take off because it always has before and uh, that's a fact and he was talking about the interesting concept that facts have only existed since science has existed 1903 to be specific no 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 uh, earlier than that but certainly a few hundred years at best now Prior to that time, what we take to be a fact, Aristarchus, for instance, the, the, we, we think that Aristarchus was enunciating a fact. No, facts didn't, wouldn't exist for two thousand, well, a thousand years, I guess, or 1,700 years. A fact is something that exists quite apart from and quite separate from the person who enunciated it. You don't need to know who first enunciated the fact that planes can fly. You get on the plane and you assume that it reaches a certain speed and the pilot says rotate, it will take off. Well, that's a fact. Facts have only existed since methodological naturalism has existed. And we use facts all the time, but we project them back into antiquity as you did with Aristarchus. Now, Aristarchus did a good job, as I recall, of calculating the Earth's uh, diameter. He made two mistakes, they compensated, so he came out actually pretty close to the truth. Um, by but a even the mistakes weren't that bad. No, the mistakes weren't that bad. But his idea didn't catch on, because there wasn't any such thing as a fact which people would understand at that point had to do <laughs> with methodological naturalism that now takes facts and uh, enables us to come up with a coherent scientific theory based upon methodological naturalism. And I think we do a disservice if we project this idea that we have, that facts exist and are reliable, whether or not we know who first enunciated them, back into the mists of time when there weren't any such things. They were only people who had opinions and the most important, the king's opinion obviously outweighed anybody else's. 
Today, if a king <laughs> makes a statement of fact and it turns out to be wrong, we don't give him any, uh, any deference because he's the most important person in town or in the country. Well, um, we, we get on planes because we, <coughs> we know for a fact that the plane can take off. Um, 400, 500 years ago, people didn't know that. And we were dealing with um, opinions by important people. And uh, facts that we now take to be detached from people up until the time they became detached always had some element of personality to them. Uh, I we, would, we don't think that way anymore. Yeah. And that's why we have this argument about philosophical naturalism, because it goes hand in hand with facts and a lot of what, I, by the way, I enjoyed thoroughly what you did. Um, and uh, Thank you. Uh, I, I thought that the, the last seg segment was particularly intriguing on whether or not evolution is scientific. Um, two comments here, but maybe I'll, I'll, I'll make one other comment too, and that is that, uh, um, uh, two comments. One is that Aristarchus should be read before we uh, ignore uh, what he had to say like the, many of the ancients did. Um, the, the current, if you want to call it scientific or non-scientific consensus back then, of course, was against Aristarchus, I think. I think that's fair to say. And, um, it wasn't scientific. Well, that's what I say. It, whether it's scientific, it, certainly the c current consensus of that day was against him. Um, it would be interesting to see what arguments he used, and the reason why I say that is because it may turn out to be these far more scientific than one might think. I was struck by reading Ptolemy, and I think that uh, uh, I think that Lakatos was a little too hard on Ptolemy. Um, I, I would rather c classify his science as uh, incomplete or bad or whatever you want to call it science rather than not at all because it is of interest that, for example, he argued that the earth was round um, and he gave some very cogent reasons for doing so, including that when you looked out there you saw a ship coming up, uh, sail first and then... and. And and you could have been correct. My guy, yeah, yeah, my point is that only the <laughs> science requires facts. Well, no, facts like have only existed for yeah, 400 years. Influenced by the Eastern. And methodological naturalism uh, really yeah. depends on facts. You know, I I'd be even cautious about that. And the reason I'd be cautious about that is because Joseph, when Mary turned up pregnant, knew where babies came from. And he didn't understand all of the physiology, but he understood enough of it to figure out what was going on. Let's give him a chance to respond to this in a minute, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, and then we'll, we'll let sure. you go for it. But can you hand the mic back? Oh. Yeah. Um, and that, and that uh, uh, the man born blind. Who, who is responsible for Leah becoming pregnant? Uh, Leah? No, uh, the Bible is quite explicit. God opened her womb. Yes, but <laughs> Jacob had something to do with it. Uh, absolutely. She okay. considered him totally inadequate and told him so. Um, she said, <laughs> have, have you read what, what, um, what Rachel told her husband? Rachel said, uh, give me children yeah, uh, or, I'll, or I'll die. I'll kill myself. And, uh, yeah. No, the Bible's quite explicit that God was involved in all of these, and in fact, that God opened Leah's womb because God saw that she wasn't approved of by her husband, and in compensation, he gave her children. Now, we, I know where we're yes. going, but for them, sure, they understood that, that, uh, but, that, but, Joe, that uh, Jacob had a part to play in it, but the but, Bible is explicit that God opened Leah's womb. Yes. You can't be more yes. definitive than that. Yes, but there's, a, there's, another, there's another aspect of it too, and that is um, that the man born blind apparently had been doing some uh, research, historical research if you like, and said 
to the Pharisees when the, during, in the middle of the discussion, never since the beginning of the world has it been known that a man who was born blind was able to see. And then drew the obvious conclusion if this man were of God, if were not of God, he could do nothing. In other words, he was using uniform experience, which is, a, I think, a fair precursor for the science of today. Um, I, I think there's a significant difference. And I think part of our problem is that we approach the science or the observations of people in the past with our knowledge of how methodological naturalism works in today's world. And that gets us into difficult situations. Well, let me, let me push it a little further then. If there was a, uh, the Philistines wanted to know whether this was of God or whether this is just something that happened. And so they did a little test. They tied up two cows that, were, that had recently had calves and were you know, producing milk and wanted their calves and put their calves back and put the cows in front of the, the uh, conveyance that carried the ark. And they said explicitly, you know, if this, you know, if the cows turn back, well, that's just the way things are. If they turn and go to Israel, then we know that this God really wants this done. And in that, they show an appreciation for the order of nature that allows for perhaps not a theological background, but, a, but certainly a practical background of some things just happen ordinarily and some things God, it is obvious that is the finger of God. And one can say, yes, but they believe God did everything. But hey, I believe God did everything. So that doesn't differentiate us, strictly speaking. They, uh, there are several translations of the Bible that refer to that um, episode as chance was effective if, I'm sorry, that if, uh, <coughs> that it was either God by God or by chance. <coughs> well, um, my point is only this. That word chance is being used in a completely different sense than the way in which um, we've, you or uh, one of the commentators have said that the universe came into existence by chance. There is such a thing, and the Bible obviously, the people of the Bible knew it, it called happenstance. If they were walking and a tree fell on them, then it was chance. But that's not anything like the same thing that saying that a chance fluctuation in a quantum vacuum produced the universe. We're using the same word to mean two completely different things. Yes, the ancients were very keen observers of nature. They had to be. They mostly were farmers. Methodological naturalism is quite different. And it's different because we have facts and we we do, we do studies in order to determine more facts. And we al arrange those facts in such a way that we have nature accounting for much of what happens. If we project that back and say they, th they thought the same way we did with facts, I think we are doing ourselves and them an injustice. Because that's only been true for the last 400 years since the rise of science. And science is the study of and the collection of facts that do not depend upon the scientist being around to tell you. Prior to that, you needed Aristarchus to tell you that the earth was, and because no, nobody really believed uh, him to be uh, worthwhile, then his ideas didn't catch on, even though today we would say he was absolutely correct 2,000 years earlier. But I fear that we're losing our audience. <laughs> That's okay. We're well, keeping most of the most important parts of it. So, yeah. I, I agree with a lot of things you said, Dr. Bull. I, I disagree with one part. I think you're you're mixing at least two different concepts. 
in ways that confuses the issue. Uh, I was born in 1941. Pearl Harbor was bombed in 1941. I don't think my birth had anything to do with Pearl Harbor. So if just because two things happen at the same time doesn't mean that they're related. Now, I would agree that methodological nationalism at its beginning was important because it got scientists to stop interpreting philosophical, uh, I mean, uh, physiological things, etc., in mystical ways. But the facts have not come to since then because of, mis of naturalism, but because we've been learning a lot more and be willing to think that things, yeah, there is a mechanism. That's why we've gotten these facts and why we have them recently. So there was, yeah, naturalism was important for a while, but it, it's, uh, but you, to mix one and say because this happened at the same time as this doesn't necessarily fit. I, I think there may be one more thing that's important with this, and that is that uh, supposing God were to interfere with the lab, uh, would that mean that he would make things worse or might he actually make things better? Uh, it's of interest that the experiments that Gregor Mendel did are actually a little bit too good, statistically speaking. And I would argue that God wanted Mendel to find those laws and that he wanted them to come out when they did, and that he actually arranged the experiments so that they, they were a little too good, and he could get away with that because uh, Mendel wasn't enough of a mathematician to be able to figure out, well, it really should be a little messier than it is. <laughs> uh, I'd like to point out in response to the point that was made up there, that one of the biggest disputes in philosophy of science that has existed at least since the Enlightenment has been exactly what the role of the observer and the fact are the roles and how they interact. And of course, there have been two schools of thought on it. Uh, one school has said that facts exist, as was just argued up there, independently of the observer, and that you get agreement among observers or corroboration because the fact is what it is. And if they do their work properly, they're bound to agree. And the other point of view has been that facts do not exist independently of the observer, and the observer contributes something to the nature of the fact. And so you can even get disagreements about what the facts are, no matter how carefully they're measured, depending on what the observer brings to them. The first point of view, uh, historically in the history of science, or philosophy of science, was argued by David Hume, who said that the so-called uniformities of nature on which scientific laws and theories are founded are nothing but observed uh, sequences uh, that uh, have no evidence of necessity about them. He, and he extended that even to the law of causation, so-called. The other point of view, later taken by Immanuel Kant, was that the mind invents concepts which it colleagues and organizes sense perceptions, and therefore uh, what we call the finished per perception is much the point of view of the observer as it is an independent fact. And of course, recently, quantum theory has raised that issue again because it shows that consciousness is always bound up, the consciousness of the experimenter, in the result that he finds. And some quantum theorists take that so far as to saying that consciousness actually collapses a possibility into an actuality. Yeah. Uh, that's the extreme position. On the other hand, Niels Bohr in the Corp Copenhagen solution takes the opposite point of view. So it's not as clear cut as was argued out there. It's debatable in science. Yeah. 
We should give you a... Uh, let's uh, uh, hand the microphone back here. <laughs> All right. Um, I guess those of us that believe that it's a fact that airplanes can fly will continue to fly, and those who don't, won't. Well, those who, those who I believe that airplanes can fly too, but uh, I think they, it may be because of God's, irregular, uh, God's regularities that he's sustaining all the time. And uh, so I'm not sure that that's a good enough to, uh, d uh, differentiation.